Hey everyone, Christy Rice here, author of Painterly Days and Christy's Cutting Garden, and I am here to talk about watercolor paper today. I'm going to share a little bit about both of the book series, but then I'm going to get right to it with a demo. Here you have my books, Painterly Days, Spring, Summer, Fall, and Winter Cutting Garden. And there they are again. So my reason for showing you the books, showing you Painterly Day's flower next to Spring Cutting Garden, uh, is just to show you a little bit about their similarities and their differences. And I promise you that watercolor paper ties into this. Um, the books open up, as you've seen, if you've been on my channel for any amount of time. And the original Painterly Day's had artwork on both sides. There's absolutely no bleed through with this particular watercolor paper. Um, so you can actually paint on both sides in the Painterly Days book. We switched it up a bit for the Cutting Garden series. Same structure to the book, same format, but a little bit of a difference in size. As you can see, it's eight and a half by 11 versus nine by 12. And the artwork is not double-sided anymore. Uh, there's also a change in the style of artwork and also the um, darkness of the outline. Painterly Days, as you see on the left, is a little lighter, where Christie's Cutting Garden is a little darker. But the difference is pretty negligible. Got a lot going on in here. So, wanted to show you a couple of things. The paint on that blank side on the left is actually because I was so impatient that I closed the book before it was dry. But you can see it's not from the previous page. As you can see, the back of the page that I painted has absolutely no bleed through. And why this ties into watercolor paper is because um, a lot of people have questioned the paper in the books. They like it, it's cool, they have fun painting on it, but they're like, is it really watercolor paper? You know, it kind of ripples a little bit when you paint, although I don't think it ripples that much there. <laughs> um, you know, you uh, some people say that it does go through to the other side. Um, if you are using, this is really important, if you are using like an alcohol-based media, a marker, it will bleed through, and I'll show you that a little bit later. But as long as you're using water-based media, you won't see any bleed through. The paper in both books, series Painterly Days and Christie's Cutting Garden is exactly the same. And again, it is a watercolor paper. It's on the thinner side of watercolor papers. It feels a lot like cardstock, but it absolutely does not act like cardstock. And so here begins my discussion of watercolor paper. As I flip through the book here, I'm just going to kind of show you some highlights of the two books that I'm talking about, show you more examples of it not bleeding through, because absolutely a real watercolor paper has two distinct qualities. It's thick enough and powerful enough to not bleed through when you paint on the front. So you could, should be able to paint on both front and back of true watercolor paper without seeing any bleed through. True watercolor paper also has a slower drying time. So that's why we put in the flaps in the book so that you could protect your other pages if you did want to close your book before it was completely dry. Some people worry about smudging, so a lot of people don't do that, but I do. I tend to be a little bit more of a free spirit. So anyway, real watercolor paper has the ability to be painted on both sides because it is thicker and more robust, and it also has a slower drying time. So for example, if you were, if we were using cardstock in these books, you would paint on the paper and it would immediately dry, almost immediately dry. Flipping through the Woodland book here, this is one of my, my personal copies I haven't painted in yet. I have like six personal copies. Anyway, um, but if you were to try to paint on cardstock, it dries super quick and you would lay a bit of color down and it would just suck up the color, dry and create a really ugly splotch. Okay, here is an example of where I use marker that pink corally color, that was marker that I used. I tested out on the other side, even though I knew that this paper wasn't gonna handle alcohol-based media, um, I used the marker on those peony buds and boom, it went right through. So yes, keep with water-based media. Showing you here a page that I painted really heavily, lots of glazing, layers and layers of color, nothing on the back but the other painting. 
No splotches, no smudges from the first side, just another painting I was able to execute. Here's another example. Both of these pages were painted really heavily, lots and lots of layers. Hardly any ripple when they're dry. They will ripple when you um, are actively painting. Any watercolor paper will ripple when you're actively painting. Um, but when they dry, they dry flat. So going back to cardstock, and I'm gonna start a demo here as I talk about watercolor paper, and then I am going to get into the description of the demo a little bit more. But cardstock, and a lot of people have asked me, Christy, this feels like cardstock. Are, are you sure it's watercolor paper? Which cracks me up. So yes, um, the paper in my books does look and feel a little bit like cardstock. It is a different kind of watercolor paper than many are used to. It's what we call hot press. Hot press basically means it's a smooth watercolor paper. It's gonna look and feel a lot like cardstock. All right, we'll get back to more about the watercolor paper in a bit. I want to talk to you a little bit about what I'm using here. This is the Kiritake Ganzai Tambi 36 color set. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. I've looked all over for ways to really pronounce it, and I cannot find it. So it is what it is. I've swatched out the colors here on the right, and I love this set. It is what, if someone emails me, and they often do, Christy, what is the next watercolor set I should get? I don't wanna spend a ton of money. This is the one. It's like $28 right now. The last time I looked on Amazon, you get 36 highly pigmented, creamy, velvety colors. Love, love, love. Okay, I did rip out the page. I don't normally do that, but I actually wanted to paint on top of another page, again, to show you that there should be no bleed through and there will be no bleed through. So we're gonna go ahead. This is from um, my uh, third book in the series of Christie's Cutting Garden. This is from the Fall Cutting Garden. Two brushes I'm using are Princeton Brushes Neptune number no. eight and Windsor and Newton University Series Round Brush. It's a number no. six. So those are the two brushes I'm using. I'm just going to zoom in here a bit so you can really see what's going on. And we're going to get started. I'm going to go in like I do a lot with clean water on my brush and painting into some of these leaves with clean water. I'm using the Windsor and Newton brush. And one thing I want to call to your attention is that I am not working on one area only at a time. You'll notice I put some water on two leaves and a bloom. So that's important because watercolor, no matter what kind of paper you're working on, whether it's quality, super high quality, or super low quality student grade watercolor paper, no watercolor paper likes to be bothered. And what I mean by that is no watercolor paper likes to be worked on in one area for any length of time. It will start to get mad at you, so to speak. So if you continue to work in one particular area on a piece of watercolor paper, I don't care if it's the most expensive in the world, it's going to start to get distressed. The surface of the paper will, in some way, start to break down. So this is something that I actually, I struggled through as a student in high school. I did take private art lessons, not really private, it wasn't a group, but whatever. It was private, it sounds very shishy, but it is what it is. I took lessons and I just like to like zoom in on one part of the painting and just kill it until I thought it was dead. And I would like literally almost put holes in my paper. It was ridiculous. So finally in college, after struggling with this like hyper focused painting style, one of my art teachers in college was like, you need to dance your brush around the page. You need to keep your hand moving and dance and dance and dance around the page. And I've never forgotten that. And so that has helped me keep a really good fresh surface on my watercolor paper. And it's also helped me just look at my paintings while I'm working from a very kind of fresh perspective. I don't allow myself most of the time to get tangled up in one small area for any length of time. And it just, my paintings are better for it. So I've just been moving along here, hopping around. I've been adding some really light blue into the wet areas. Sometimes I'm just adding a wet brush of blue directly onto the page and flooding some other colors into it. 
Um, I'm not mixing on a palette, guys. You know I'm really not big about mixing on a palette. I like to let the colors mingle on the page. I've been using some light blue off of this palette. I've been using, there's a really pretty specific creamy light blue. You can see it there under my wrist. And that one I've been using a lot here. There's also an equally beautiful kind of teal that is not on screen here that I've used in the leaves. But then I'm going in with more of an indigo. I'm going in with a little bit of a, a pinky tone to make kind of a purple happen in some of these blooms. And I'm just using kind of a wet and wet technique, not too much pressure on my brush, and just dotting around the color, making sure I'm not scrubbing too much. Like right there, I'm actually gonna have to control myself. I'm starting to scrub a little, so I'm gonna pull some of that color out. Any watercolor paper that you're working on, if you start to see the surface start to, to degrade a little bit, you can always add clean, clean water to it. And see how much water is on there? You can always add clean water onto an area that you feel looks like it's getting overworked and it'll kind of smooth things out. And I'm gonna show you that in detail and up close later on. So right now in those areas, I'm gonna stop. I, I'm, I'm saying to myself, Christy, I'm gonna overwork this if you keep working on those flowers. So I'm moving on. Clean water here on this little trumpet shaped flower. The light blue again, going around the edges. I'm not filling in. And that's one thing that I've learned that's been difficult for those who are transitioning from traditional adult coloring books with uh, colored pencils. It's difficult for them to take a lighter approach and to also loosen up a little bit in terms of this. In traditional coloring books, there are very defined shapes that you fill in bit by bit. You fill in this part of the leaf next to that part of the leaf next to that part of the leaf and so on and so on and so forth. My water watercoloring books are quite different. There's more open space, although some of the sketches do have tiny little areas for those of you who like detail. But the, the type of artwork that I've illustrated here really encourages you to use a bigger brush, be more kind of expressive, really use that open space to let the watercolor flood in and around. And that's what I'm doing here, adding more water to this leaf. All right, see in a traditional coloring book, oftentimes those little veins in the leaves would continue all the way to the outer edge and would create all these little compartments of the leaf for you to color. But in a watercolor coloring book, that's just not as much fun. It may be what you're comfortable with, but come on, it's not as much fun. The thing about watercolor is it wants to move and it wants to have freedom. And I've tried to allow for that in these books. Still moving around here, not staying too long in any one area. Being mindful too, if I come back to a flower, start a new flower that is directly next to a flower that I've recently painted, I'm gonna to have to contend with some issues like bleeding, color bleeding into one another, uh, but just something to keep in mind as you're talking to yourself as you're painting. Right there, I added a little bit of that pink color into the wet blue, and then I rinsed my brush and just had some wet, um, just some water on there, of course, water's wet, huh? Um, and let it blend out a little bit using that clean water on my brush. Right there, I'm just adding the pink onto a dry page, using water on my brush to blend it out. Rinsing my brush again, and adding a really dark blue into that wet pink area. It's bleeding a little too much, so I'm going back in with a dry brush and cleaning it up a bit. All right, just continuing on here with that light blue. Another thing too, you know, again, more to the end of, don't try to approach a water coloring book like you would a traditional coloring book, is that you don't have to fill in perfectly. So if you notice that first flower I started painting there again, I just kind of like dotted in the color. I didn't worry too much about it being perfectly filled in right to the edge. Again, that's some of the beauty of watercolor is letting it just do its thing and letting it be imperfect just like right there where that pink is flooding into my green leaf. I took a dry brush there and just lifted it out and blotted on my paper towel in between each blot. Moving along, moving along. 
There we go. There's that clean water technique. I just added some clean water to that area I had been working on. If you missed it, rewind, watch it over again, pause it. But I just took a big drop of clean water and let it drop onto that flower and it just smoothed everything out I had been working on and blended everything together nicely. I'm purposely choosing a variety of greens now. I'm going into a more grassy green if you zoom in or um, I don't, you can't zoom in, but I don't know what I'm talking about apparently. But if you pause, you can maybe see the color codes on this palette. Um, some of it is in, um, another language that I don't understand. So, uh, but this is kind of just a beautiful grassy green. And again, I purposely don't often mention specific colors because I know a lot of you are not gonna be working with the same palette that I am. So I'm giving you more generic colors so you're not fretting about not having, not having the same exact materials that I have. So I'm going into the vines of the Morning Glories here, the leaf, the smaller leaf details, and I'm adding that grassy green and kind of a bright yellow. Um, and I am going in with that pure creamy teal that I mentioned and adding touches here and there. I'm just trying to mix things up, make sure the greens are pretty dynamic and interesting and not all the same everywhere. And the same thing goes for these purples and these blues that I'm using in the morning glories. Um, I want to make sure that it's interesting and that you, you know, when you're viewing this painting, you actually want to continue looking at it so that your eye kind of pops around to different areas of the painting. So some flowers are more purple, some are more raspberry, as you can see, and some are more blue. And again, that's by design. Things you can be thinking about as you're navigating your painting. You know I mentioned earlier that watercolor paper, one of the two key factors, in my opinion, of a, a decent watercolor paper is drying time and of course, you know, it not bleeding through onto the other side. If you'll notice, the drying time on the paper here, as I've been going back into areas that I've worked on minutes and minutes and minutes ago, they are still wet. And that's one of the things that I was so proud of and excited about when this paper came across my desk before, when these books were just a dream. When we were just looking at samples, I was like, oh my goodness, this paper is fantastic. It takes a good seven to 10 minutes for a very saturated area to dry. And even after that, it's pretty much still damp. And that is just fantastic. And the reason why is because you have time to work. You have time to go back in, dot some more color in, and still have it blend beautifully. You have time to also lift out a color or as much of a color as possible because maybe you just thought it was too dark or you didn't like it like I'm doing right there. I'm lifting out color. So that's something you really wanna think about when you're wondering, well, what makes a good watercolor paper? Um, and again, even though this water, the watercolor paper here that I'm working on in the books is smooth, it has some really, really amazing characters to a professional grade watercolor paper. And no, by no means is the paper in the books professional. However, it kind of acts professional in a lot of ways, which I love. Um, because honestly, I've said it before, if we use professional watercolor paper in these books, they would be stupid expensive and nobody wants that. And they'd also be stupid thick. <laughs> you would literally have a two inch thick book and you'd be walking around with an extra four, three to four pounds in your bag. Nobody wants that. So we set out to find a paper that was lightweight enough, but still super, super robust and had the characteristics of a professional watercolor paper. And we found it. So. Anyway, continuing on with this, and later on, stick around because I am going to show you some demos on two of my favorite professional watercolor papers, um, and I'm going to compare them to what we've been working on here in the books. So that leaf is dry. I'm going to show you a little bit of glazing. I'm going to go back over with a somewhat clean brush. There's a little bit of yellow on there. I'm going to go back over and show you how you can add some more detail and some more color to an area that's already been painted. So now I'm able to use that new surface of wet that I added and add more color, which I'm doing with a really bright yellow and now a really intense blue. 
I'm careful when I add these intense colors not to add them all the way around the edge of an item um, or an object, whatever you want to call it, uh, a leaf in this case, because it starts to look like an outline. And I am of the thinking um, with coloring books, water coloring books, that I don't want necessarily to always see those lines. I don't want my eye to immediately go to the outlines. Uh, so I, I don't want to exaggerate the outline feel. Something I did there, I added a little bit of like a creamy, peachy tone. And that can make the leaf look really sun-kissed, which I love. Added a little bit of line quality there. I really pushed the limits of my number six Windsor & Newton brush and used just the tip. Um, I didn't totally love the way that that turned out, so I added a bit of water to smooth it out a bit um, and, and to feel better about it. Um, this is a splattering technique. Love this. Two brushes. I've shown this in other um, demos before. Two brushes. The one that I'm tapping, the Red University Series Windsor & Newton, is the one loaded up with a lot of wet color. And I'm tapping that against a completely clean brush to produce the spatter effect. This is fantastic if you want to cover up little mistakes. You want to cover up smudges. You want to cover up going outside of the line too much. Fantastic. Love, love, love this for that. It's time to get into the nitty gritty of my very non-scientific talk about watercolor paper. I've discussed the two elements that I think really quantify a good watercolor paper I've talked about not working in an area for too long, but right now I'm actually going to push the limits of the watercolor paper in my coloring books. I'm adding color here and I'm actually going to, on purpose, scrub and overwork this flower because I want you to see what will happen when that is done. So I'm happily adding in my color, my my wet glazes, I'm adding in some darker tones up here. I'm doing it right. I'm doing this technique that I've been doing all along in this demo. Moving along, adding a really deep, rich indigo up there for some shading. It's bleeding out too much again, so I'm probably gonna scoop up a little bit of it, blend it out a little bit. But now I'm going in and I'm going to scrub. Look closely, look what's happening. I'm going in, I'm gonna scrub, and I'm gonna scrub, and I'm, this is excessive. But this is the same kind of stroking marks that you would do with a colored pencil. You'd go back and forth in an area, moving ever so slightly. And this is what a lot of people, I'm finding out just from talking to people and having conversations, this is how they're approaching their coloring books with watercolor and specifically my books, Painterly Days and Christie's Cutting Garden. So the more you scrub, the longer you scrub in one area, the paper is going to start to lift and, and peel a little bit. Scrub, scrub, scrub. If you didn't see it, go back, rewind and take a look. The paper was starting to get distressed and starting to ball up a little bit, see that? But again, you should not be working in one area on any watercolor paper for that long. Now, little secret, if that happens in the books in Christie's Cutting Garden or Painterly Days, if you start to get the paper breaking down, just add more water. Legitimately, look at what I'm doing here. I'm adding more water and all those little defects, if you look close that were happening, they're smoothing out. They're smoothing out. And the same smoothing out technique can happen and will work on even professional grade watercolor paper. So have fun with that guys and let me bring in Stonehenge cold press. Let's talk about cold press versus hot press. Cold press paper, you can see it there, has a very distinctive texture. You can see this Stonehenge cold press is slightly thicker than the Painterly Days paper, but the big, big, big difference is the texture kind of flopping them around so you can see they're both just as flexible. 
And again, remember, Painterly Days and Christie's Cutting Garden is a hot press. Now I'm going to bring in a hot press from Arches. Arches is renowned for their paper. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. This is so fun. Again, guys, I'm not a scientist. I am not the kind of artist that knows the technical, super fancy ins and outs of materials and watercolor paper, but I do know how to talk about paper in a, in a casual way and just from experience, from literally over 20 years experience. So um, that is what I'm doing today. I'm making no claims to be an expert on the technique, technical aspects of watercolor paper. So Painterly Days again, Christie's Cutting Garden, my books are using a hot press. So let's put hot press and cold press next to one another and start to do some tests. I am adding water. This is the hot press from Arches. You can immediately see that the paper is distressed, immediately. Hot press paper tends to get distressed quicker and easier than cold press. Look at that. But boom, I add water and it smooths right out. Don't forget that little trick. If your paper's getting distressed, add a ton of water and let it just spread out and smooth everything out. Scrubbing, scrubbing, scrubbing. Again, hot press, smooth surface from arches. And look, it's pilling. The surface is getting distressed. So my point is, is that pilling and the distressed surface of a, of a watercolor paper is gonna happen with any watercolor paper, expensive, student grade, whatever it may be. It's going to happen because the paper is begging you to move. The paper is begging you to move around and not continue to work in one area for any length of time. I'm going to do the same thing over here um, and I'm going to just try to distress this paper. Now this paper is not as easy to distress, but it will. It will start to pill. One thing I wanna to mention too, is that the textured watercolor paper is what most people are accustomed to seeing and feeling. It's when they think of watercolor paper, when a lot of people think of watercolor paper, they think of cold press. They think all watercolor paper should be textured, and that's not the case. But take a look there, Stonehenge, cold press, textured on the left, arches, hot press, smooth on the right, and then of course my books, the watercolor paper that we've used in my books in the middle. And let me tell you what, they all look like they could have been a little distressed. My little painting technique with adding clean water to a distressed area and having it smooth everything out really does work however. So I just wanted to do this little comparison for you guys so you could really understand what's at the heart and what's in the soul of a really good watercolor paper and understand the different types on a very um, kind of simple but profound level. Um, there are people out there that can talk to you until the cows come home about the technical properties of watercolor paper. But I'm here to just talk to you about the practical qualities of watercolor paper. And I really hope you've enjoyed this. I know it's been super different than many of my uh, demos. and uh, But I think it's going to give any beginner or someone who has not done uh, a ton of watercolor, a little bit of insight. And as I've been talking here, I've been again trying to distress my paper um, even further and continuing to distress the other papers even further. And um, you know, all of these papers can take a beating really well. Um, I would say the Arches is probably the most finicky and this paper is super expensive. I still love it, but it is finicky. Um, and I'm pretty proud of my paper, look at that. Again, guys, thank you so much. And I know this is a hot topic um, for all that have loved my books. The paper has come up again and again. So I hope this has been helpful. Thanks so much. <music>